Hi, welcome to another episode of Facebook Live with Veterinary Referral Center of Central Oregon. I'm Dr. Jen Bentley, I'm a dermatologist here at VRCCO, and we have a special discussion um, about Zoom medicine with Dr. Jeff Zuba. Go ahead and introduce everybody. We've got Shelby Manning, the camera, and Denali also, who will be taking your questions. So please chime in. This is a discussion, um, and we're open to answer whatever questions you have about Zoom medicine. Um, so to get us started, um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Mauricio Dehoich, and he's actually known Dr. Jeff Zuba for about 25 years. So I think he's going to be the best person to give the introductions here. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Jen. Um, so Zuba and I, I call him Zuba, or you can call him Doc. Um, sometimes I think of calling him something else. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Zuba uh, was foolish enough to take me on as uh, one of his students uh, when I was an undergrad. And I've been super, super, super fortunate um, to have been able to uh, work with him for all these years and uh, have him as a mentor. And, um, and when I first started off, I was really, really interested, and still I'm really interested in zoo medicine. And so, uh, so I thought we'd start off with, uh, why don't you tell us uh, why you went into zoo medicine? Well, I, uh, I was interested in wildlife when I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin. And then um, I was lucky enough to get into veterinary school, and I thought I was going to be a wildlife veterinarian. But what I liked was the day-to-day -day clinical work, um, being able to fix things on a day-to-day -day basis instead of doing research in epidemiology, which is usually what wildlife veterinarians do. <clears throat> so uh, my third year, I was able, or my fourth year, I was able to do externships at the San Diego Zoo. And um, then the following year, while I was in graduate school, I applied for a residency at San Diego Zoo, and I, and I somehow got that. And that kind of propelled me into uh, st sticking with zoo and wildlife medicine. Um, it's been great. So after I finished my residency at the San Diego Zoo, I taught at uh, Colorado State University at the veterinary school there for a couple of years, and then I've been at the San Diego Zoo for the past 29 years. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> at the Safari Park, we obviously, there's, there's lots of different types of animals, everything from uh, elephants to your smallest animals, but... Um, are there, do you find that there's a lot of similarities between all of these different species and just our dogs and cats? Is there a lot of same things or is it just completely different medicine? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the same. When we go to, we all went to the same veterinary type of veterinary school. Um, and we learn about basically eight species. We learn about the cow and the pig, the horse, the sheep, the goat, the dog, the cat, and poultry basically is what we learn about. But those species are what I use as prototypes when I'm working with wolves and tigers and elephants and zebras, um, nilgai, um, condors, things like that. So we use okay. what we learned in veterinary school in domestic animals and we apply it in our non-domestics. I see. And so just because they have a different colored fur doesn't change <laughs> their anatomy or their physiology. In that, and this example would be a zebra. If, um, if it smells like a horse and I start sneezing when I'm close to it, it's a horse. <laughs> and that's what happens with zebras. So zebras are the same, and they have the same internal organs, they have the same reproductive tract, they have the same sensitivities to some of the drugs that we use. The same, we use the same antibiotics that they use in the same as, as in the domestic um, horse. So it's very, very similar. Um, there are differences, of course, with, uh, like with marine mammals, and some of the bird species and reptiles where we don't have a prototype species. But we kind of, we can use the same diagnostics that are here in this hospital here with CT scans and ultrasounds and radiographs. And we can use that same technology to diagnose and treat diseases in our non-domestic animals. Wow, and at the wildlife park, what types of diagnostic capacities do you guys have over there? Yeah, we're, we're really lucky, the San Diego Zoo Global supports their the animals that we have under our care um, to the nth degree. So we have state of the heart, state of the art um, hospital. We actually at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park where I work, we have the world's largest zoo and wildlife hospital wow. in the world. It's, oh it's basically 1.5 acres under a roof, about 70,000 square feet. We've got CT scans, we've got a couple ultrasound. Um, we've got a staff of about 40 people, oh, wow. um, so it, it's really, uh, we are able to do uh, top-notch work. That's amazing. Um, that said, we still 
utilize places like the referral center here. Um, and these, the audience probably doesn't know, but we've utilized uh, Dr. Jen, Dr. Mauricio, Dr. Matt here at the referral center for um, different cases. I know I've consulted with yes. you. On, um, on what was it? Uh, we had a, a bunch of our kangaroos and wallabies had a skin disease and it ended up being ringworm. And right. you, helped, you helped me with that case. Um, and then we also had, what was it? It was a giraffe. Remember the giraffe that had the, yeah, the ear yeah. dermatitis that you right. helped out with? So yeah. Jen doesn't work with um, giraffes on a routine basis or macropods, but she understands the basic physiology and treatment and diagnostics of that. And that's why we refer um, to you for that type of thing. Mauricio um, has helped out numerous times over the years. Um, Let's see, he helped out, uh, you, you helped uh, with an aardvark. Remember we had to do the aardvark. total hip on an aardvark? Yeah. I yeah. scrubbed into that crane. one too, That's that right. was we really had, interesting. We had the anteater. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was a crane, remember we fixed the fracture on yeah. that thing. So we utilize the expertise here at referral centers um, to help us. Even Dr. Matt here helped me with a case in a dole dog, which is um, it's a wolf-like animal found in the northern part of Russia and things like that. Um, he didn't know what a dull dog was, <laughs> but he understands the physiology and pharmacology and the disease process in a canid. And a dull dog is in the canine family, and he was able to kind of adjust his thought process a little bit so that he could help us out with, a, with pancreatitis in a dull dog. And that's exactly what you would see here at the referral hospital. Wow. So we're able to use those um, experts uh, to help us at the park. And then we have we, we have so at, at the park we have large animals surgeons small animal surgeons internal medicine dermatologists radiologists um, that help us on a day to day basis to get to take care of our collection animals. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to bring up because I don't think a lot of people understand like how much actually goes into these parks and these zoos and how well these animals are, are truly taken care of with top notch care. And if you guys are just joining us, um, please chime in and join the discussion. You can ask any question. And we've got Dr. Jeff Zubik from the San Diego Wildlife Park um, to answer any questions you have about these amazing species. Um, and I guess I have a question. How um, you actually almost, I believe, single-handedly developed a ventilator from elephants. Can you describe um, basically why that was so important for mm -hmm. these these large animals and what you're using, uh, what they're going under anesthesia for? Sure. Um, well, the original, the, I, I was blessed and lucky to be part of a group of international veterinarians who uh, developed a method to vasectomize free-ranging bull elephants in Africa as a means to uh, contracept them. So the problem is, is that globally, elephants are endangered, but locally, they're too invasive. Some of them, there's, there's just too many in, in areas. So we have to do something about it. And, and historically, what they've done is that they cull them, which they do as a humane um, euthanasia, which is very, very controversial. Nobody wants to do that, but it was the only way that they really could control the population. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's got to be a better way to manage the reproductive um, success of these animals. Mm -hmm. So vasectomies are used very commonly in humans and in dogs and cats and horses and cows and things like this. So why can't we try something like that in Africa in bull elephants? And nobody's ever tried that before. So the theory is, is that if you ever heard of about 40 elephants, <clears throat> there's maybe one or two males that will service that population. and breed the females. Meanwhile, he, his other job, not just breeding, he's keeping all the other males away from those females. Okay. So that, that's part of his job. That's why it's usually the biggest and the strongest of the, the, the elephants. Some of these elephants are over 11 feet tall. They're over 16,000 pounds. <clears throat> oh my so, gosh. so what we do is that we vasectomize them. And, the, and by vasectomizing them, you don't change their hormones. So they're still able to, to breed but they're shooting blanks basically, I right? See. Because the plumbing has been cut. And so the, the sperm does not find the reproductive tract of the female. So he's still servicing those females, yeah, but he's shooting blanks. So he has zero population growth huh. and it works a hundred percent. Wow. But so, but the problem was is that nobody's ever done anything like this before. And when we were starting out, it would take us probably five to six hours to accomplish something like this in the bush. Because yeah. we have to, we approach the elephants with, uh, by helicopter, dart them, 
with an ultra potent opioid <clears throat> that anesthetizes them in probably 12 to 15 minutes. And then we have to, just like if it's a dog or cat here or a human going into the hospital for surgery, you would like to establish an airway. You'd like to control the physiology of the animal to make sure that he's nice and safe during anesthesia. And that's what we, that's what we needed to do too. But we didn't have a method of, of intubating and ventilating an elephant out in the wild that had never been developed before. So I started talking to numerous people um, in the industry and they thought it was a pretty cool idea. Yeah. So we developed uh, what's called a mega, mega vertebrate um, ventilator and it's uh, just it's actually a simple mechanism it's just an uber sized ventilator like what you guys have here but i had to make it portable affordable and really tough because we were in either in the back of a truck or in a helicopter um, <laughs> where we'd have to jump out and intubate an elephant um, in the wild so uh -huh. that we could keep them nice and safe during anesthesia how big was the team to do all of this yeah that's a great question so it was a minimum for us to do a surgery out in the in the field or in the bush, probably about 35 people wow. that it would take, and everybody would have a job. And so we would have, we'd have anesthesia team, a surgical team. Um, the interesting thing about the surgical part of it is that elephants are a very unique mammal on this earth. Not only are they large and all this type of thing, but their testes are actually located inside their abdomen next to their kidneys. Oh, so, gosh. so it doesn't have something. You can't do an external vasectomy. Oh. So, you have to be able Come to on. go in laparoscopically to find the best efforts to sever it, so that you can best optimize the animal. Oh. So, there's all sorts of challenges that we had. They're generally non-compliant patients <laughs> um, and big and dangerous. And we're always picking the we're picking the biggest bulls yeah, right in, the the, one. in there. So, um, but it, it it works 100. percent We were over there 11 years in a row. Uh, we we so probably cool. have saved at least we figure about between 800 and a thousand um, oh elephants over there from the work that we did over there because That's now amazing. they there's no reproductive um, increases so they don't have to call the animals right. so that's what and oh, we're still so working cool. over there wow. trying to accomplish that yeah. And one of the, I guess, one thing that's probably on a lot of the viewers' mind is how do they recover in the wild? Is it can you reverse the anesthesia really fast, or is it kind yeah. of a process? That's a, no, it's a question. That's why what we do is that we use ultra potent opioids um, that are very very dangerous. If if, if humans get exposed to it, <clears throat> the, 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 just in the tip of the needle would be enough for all of us to go into respiratory depression. It's extremely, extremely potent and powerful, but we need it to be concentrated enough so we can put it into a dart and remotely deliver it to the elephant. So we need a, a drug that's reversible, and that's these opioids that we use. <clears throat> so at the end of the surgery, the animal's still under the influence of it, it's anesthetized, so it's muscle relaxation, analgesia, unconsciousness, and um, so that's what happens when you get the drug. So what we do is we need to get that animal up really quick because we can't have it waking up slow because another elephant or another animal might yeah. come and take advantage of it. So we give a, an IV injection and within usually three to five minutes they're standing and, oh, wow. and walking off after surgery. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Really it's like neat. there's a question. Yes, so Taylor is asking um, what is the infection risk? The, the infection risk? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, elephants are pachyderms. Um, and that term means that they've got thick skin, basically. And animals out in the wild, not only is it thick skin, but it's it's like a tool. I mean, it's like a big piece of luggage, and it's it's about that thick, and it's corrugated and irregular and hyperplastic and all this type of stuff. Or, um, so it's very hard to sterilize the skin. That's a great question, actually. Um, so we did um, we did lots of different methods of making sure that we surgically prep the animal, just like you would here at the referral center. Um, so we immobilized them and we had a team, the surgical team, we had technicians that would go in and scrub and scrub and scrub and make sure that it's clean. And then you make an incision through that thick skin and we have retractors that would pull it apart. And then we would re-sterilize it again because yeah, wow. then we weren't yeah. dealing with the outer tissue that's kind of contaminated. And we would put a surgical drape over it so that we would have just direct access to the port to the, uh, into the abdomen. Um, we didn't really have to worry about infection. So we, we did... Um, this was all done with small cameras, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, exactly. With laparoscopes that we developed with the help of Carl Storr's uh, company. And we were able to laparoscopically vasectomize over 80 bulls um, 
and we didn't have, and every, every one of the animals that we had, we put on a radio collar so we could follow them to make sure that we weren't doing any harm. And, um, and none of the elephants had any kind of post-op problems at all, no wow, infections. That's so, amazing. Yeah, that's I mean, we were surprised too. And I think part of it is that they might have had um, infections that we didn't know, um, but they, they were not severe. Yeah. And they, luckily, elephants are pretty darn tough. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. If you guys are just joining us, we are here with Dr. Jeff Zupa of the Wildlife uh, Safari Park. Please feel free to join the discussion and ask any questions. Um, I think I'm going to ask uh, one more question um, and just put you on the spot here. Um, can you tell us kind of any fun story that you have that you think our viewers would be interested in? I think mm. there's a good close call one or two or three. <laughs> are, yeah. you, are we yeah. allowed to tell yeah. these yeah. stories? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, there's always the, the, you'd have to be kind of, um, I would say, fleet of foot and fast and quick and make yeah. sure that you can run <laughs> faster than anybody else to get out of the way. No, it, it's, uh, we try to make it as safe as possible, but it's very physical. Of course. Um, especially working out in the bush. We've, uh, you know, I've been blessed and privileged to be part of conservation efforts all around the world, and I don't think that you can do it unless you have a little bit of, you know, that kind of being physical and things like that. Yeah. It really, it really, really helps. But, um, yeah, there's been a few instances at the at the park um, where we've reversed an animal, and there's, uh, you know, if we're wondering why the like a rhino that couldn't wouldn't stand up, and we weren't sure what happened. And well, I ended up that. The, the, the elf or the, the rhino was just sleeping. So when we went up to oh it gosh. to wake it up, it just stood up and started and charged us. So oh, that was kind of, and then as I was running, as I was running, I pulled my hamstring oh, as no. I was trying to get out of the way, and everybody thought that I was kidding. So they're going, Zuba, quit joking. There's a rhino coming after you. I'm, going, I'm not kidding. I just tore my muscle. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a close call. Oh, and and, there, and there's some dangerous things too that happen, like when we were over in Africa, helicopter problems when you're oh, sure. out darting, and that's that, that's a e ticket in itself. So yeah. it's a little scary, but that's that's the nature of the business, and we. That's part of the process, so you, yeah. have, to have, you have to have courage. Thick scanning, yeah, yeah. courage and to and be doing what you're doing. One of my mentors said, the only way that you can be brave is to be scared. Yeah. And I've been scared plenty of times <laughs> over the years <laughs> things that I've had to do. Well, gosh, thank you so much for joining us oh, today. It's, a pleasure. it's definitely a privilege to have you, and I know I'm always excited <laughs> when I get to consult with all these amazing speakers. Oh call you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, but thank you all for joining us on Facebook Live. We'll be back in, uh, I believe, a week from now on Wednesday at 4 p.m. And um, Shelby, do you know what our subject is? It's escaping my mind right now. I think it's actually <laughs> anesthesia. Is it anesthesia? Yeah, with Dr. Dehoich and going over risks. Uh, so we'll gotcha. be ready for that. And okay. people want to know about <laughs> older dogs and kind of the risks there and what to ask the veterinarian before going under these um, anesthetic Sounds perfect. It looks like so. there's maybe a question. Oh, one more yeah. question. Sophia would just like to say great information and thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Sophia. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for Bye, watching. Guys.